Good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Moyer. I'm a sales support trainer here at Simplify Power Briggs & Stratton. Uh, as we got a few people trickling in here, I want to also introduce Nathan Heston. He's one of the other sales support trainers here at uh, Simplify Power Briggs & Stratton. Nathan, why don't you go ahead and say hello? Welcome, everybody. And Daniel, hello to you as well. Looking forward to going through this training with everyone. Thank you. A couple of housekeeping items while people are still trickling in here is one, this is a NAPSEP accredited course. So you are eligible for your continuing education credits through NAPSEP. At the end of this training, we're going to pop up our email. Uh, and that's the time that you're going to uh, write down that email. Email us, let us know your uh, full name, uh, spell it out for us so we're sure to get it correct on your um, uh, credits or the certificate for completion for this course. Uh, so again, NAPSEP accredited, wait to the end because uh, you have to attend the training. We'll pop up an email and you can go ahead and email us for your credits. The other thing is that if we don't have the chat enabled on this talk, but we do have the Q&A uh, button enabled. So at the top or the bottom of the screen, you're going to see the Q&A button. Uh, go ahead and put your questions in the um, that, that uh, Q&A button. Put them in during the talk because uh, it's great. This is this is interactive. This is live, and we want to uh, answer your questions while we're doing the presentation. And I'm sure if you're asking the question, somebody else is going to be uh, asking the same question, but may not type it in. So please get the Q and A uh, chat going. It really gets this more uh, interactive. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Today's talk is about safety and standards. Um, really, and before I kind of get started into it, I think safety is, is a very important topic to talk about with energy storage. You know, when we talk about these energy storage systems for our homes, we're talking about batteries and batteries, especially lithium ion batteries are very energy dense. So you think about it, we really uh, have very small devices that can contain a lot of energy. And when we're uh, using our phones or our laptops, you know, those batteries are relatively small. But as we're scaling up these energy storage systems, as we're scaling up these batteries to be much larger and we're putting them onto our homes, I think safety is, become, is gonna become a very important uh, consideration for the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders, right? The homeowners that actually, or business owners that actually have these devices on their structures. The installers, you guys that are look, they're installing these systems, firefighters or first responders that are going to be showing up to these events. Uh, so there's a lot of um, people that are interested in safety and standards. So part of this talk today, we're going to talk about uh, battery chemistry and form factor and the tests that UL uh, does, a third-party testing lab performs on these energy storage systems. Kind of at the last half of this talk, we're going to talk a little bit more about safety during installation, right? Uh, PPE um, and, and best practices for installation. Um, you know, energy storage systems are kind of far and few between, right? There might be a couple of them in our neighborhood right now, but as the next 10 years, the next 20 years rolls along, we're going to start to see a much greater prevalence of energy storage systems where every other home in our neighborhoods have energy storage systems. What is that going to look like and how does safety matter? So if you're not already uh, having the conversation with the homeowner at the kitchen table, talking about the different options, the different features, make sure you have that conversation about safety and, and how you've vetted the products that you're offering to the homeowners to make sure that they're safe and that you've uh, taken the time to look at what types of form factors, what types of chemistries are being used. And what type of UL certifications have been um, uh, achieved on these different products? That being said, uh, there is other free training opportunities uh, besides this webinar today. Uh, with the uh, Briggs & Stratton, we have the now off able to offer the Power Academy. Power Academy is a very powerful online learning portal. Uh, there's uh, opportunities to do self-paced learning, which is great because not everybody can make it to these uh, live trainings. So you can, when you got free time in between jobs, you can jump on and do um, on-demand training. There is uh, links to do live in-person training and also virtual training. Always keep an eye on our simplifypower.com training calendar. Uh, that's where you're going to see some of uh, our upcoming live webinars that you're enjoying today. 
Simplified Power, Briggs & Stratton has really always been known for safe, proven, and simple technology. At our foundation, uh, at our founding of over 11 years now uh, ago, we were the first to come to market with a lithium iron phosphate battery, LFP, and I'll probably keep calling it LFP for the remainder of the conversation for this talk today. Uh, so cobalt free is really the key there and being cobalt free, um, we're able to avoid unmitigated thermal runaway. Nathan, um, if you want to kind of maybe break us down a little bit more about why chemistry matters and, and why cobalt can be such a, um, a dangerous or, or not dangerous, but a, a such a, has such a potential for thermal runaway, please. Well, sure, Daniel, um, and, and thanks for the opportunity. So all batteries, all lithium ion batteries um, have electrolyte. And in, until we move to like a solid state uh, chemistry where we don't have electrolyte um, that, that separates the positive and negative sides of the battery, the cathode and the anode side of the battery, um, there is the potential for fire because the electrolyte has an organic gel and that organic gel is what burns. Uh, Cobalt-based chemistry has a slightly higher voltage to it. And because the oxides themselves in the cathode have a lot more oxygen in them, you can get a much more uh, rapid uh, burning of of the electrolyte if some unforeseen circumstances cause a battery to overheat. So if the battery is in a fire or punctured or damaged in some way, maybe a car runs into it, um, it's, in a, it's in a garage and there are no parking ballards. Um, if that battery becomes damaged and gets hot, it can release that electrolyte gel as a vapor um, and that vapor is what burns. And with cobalt-based chemistry, that burning occurs very rapidly and because it occurs so rapidly, it spreads from cell to cell to cell in a chain reaction. And that chain reaction um, doesn't stop, it doesn't mitigate. And so that's why we're saying unmitigated thermal runaway here. And so the fires that you'll typically see, the battery fires that you'll typically see that, are, that, that can be pretty devastating because they can't be put out um, are these batteries that have uh, cobalt-based chemistry. Um, Thank it, you, Nathan. It, Daniel's going to get into it a little bit more later, but I mean, essentially, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. And, and that's the key word that Nathan called out there is unmitigated thermal runaway. You can still have a thermal runaway with our lithium iron phosphate batteries. It's just what happens after that thermal runaway. Does it release? Does it vent and then not propagate? So if you have unmitigated propagation, it's spreading from cell to cell to cell. And I'll get into it a little bit later, of course. Uh, one thing is that what I really like is the, the wall brackets, and I'll show them to you a little bit later. We can actually elevate the batteries up on the wall so that if somebody does inevitably uh, crash their car into uh, the wall in the garage, the batteries are going to be at a much higher level. We're going to get deeper into this, but we're going to talk a little bit later about the UL certifications. There's UL 1642 on the cell level. UL 1973 on the battery module level, and then UL 9540 on the system level. We're also going to talk a little bit about UL 9540A. That's not actually a certification. What that is, is it's a, a, a large scale fire testing that helps inform what um, is called out in our 9540A, uh, our 9540A UL listing. Additionally, we're going to talk about this a little bit later is uh, Department of Transportation, uh, UN. 3480, which allows us to ship these batteries in LTL trucks, like less than truckload freight trucks, like FedEx freight, and UN 38.3, which allows us to airship the batteries. We've been proven. We're one of the few companies that's been lo out longer than what our warranty life of our batteries are. So we have a 10-year warranty on our battery, and we've been around for longer than 10 years. So we actually do have batteries out there outliving their warranty deployed all around the world. And early on in our history, we really had an opportunity to work with the Department of Defense. Uh, the U.S. Army um, took our batteries out to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, which is out there on the East Coast, and put our batteries through some uh, rigorous testing, you know, high temperature, uh, high vibration um, uh, situations where they vetted and proved our batteries. And ultimately, we did deploy overseas at some of the uh, Marine Corps and Army's forward operating bases. 
We do have a business model that can demonstrate social impact and profitability can coexist. Uh, the so-called triple bottom line, uh, people, planet, and profits. And we do have a program, the idea program, where we give back. And if you're somebody on this call that has an idea, uh, go ahead and email us. The email is going to pop up at the end of the talk. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of uh, donations, usually in the form of batteries to clinics, uh, to hospitals, to schools, to other projects around the world, and also here in the country. Simple. We've made a battery for the uh, last 11 years or a little bit longer now that's been inverter agnostic, right? Our battery can integrate with other people's inverters or charge controllers. So whether you have uh, Samlex, uh, Schneider, Victron, SMA, uh, all Solark, a lot of different other battery options, we can integrate our battery in with them. All you have to do is get in there and adjust the set points in those ba uh, those other battery um, uh, component systems. Like what am I thinking of? I'm thinking of the bulk voltage, the, the float voltages, the max discharge, max charge currents. So we've always been known for having a battery that simply integrates into other systems. Usually lead acid battery replacements is one of our um, kind of bread and butter for a long time. That being said, now, really what the industry, how it's progressing is these vertically integrated energy storage systems. And you see it down there at the bottom of our screen, right underneath Simplify Energy Storage System, e Simplify ESS. It's our inverter, our battery, and our app. What does that mean? It means it's one tech support phone call, one warranty, one operating manual, and we know that it's all been vetted to work together right out of the box. So it's really exciting to be part of that. That doesn't mean that our battery still can't be utilized by a lot of other people's equipment. And that's a little unusual in the industry to hear uh, that energy storage system batteries can be used with other people's components and, and give those people that resilience and energy security. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but we also know some of the market drivers. A time of use rates, which is during certain times of the day, energy is more expensive. We can program these energy storage systems to discharge themselves during those specific times, saving your customers money. Demand charges, where at any moment during the day, you exceed a certain kilowatt threshold. Uh, we can, again, program energy storage systems to discharge themselves to kind of shave those peaks off. Those are more common in commercial um, systems, which I've seen a lot of more in, uh, interest in that. And I'm kind of coming out of that Solark 30K, that Solark 60K that hit the market recently. Those are uh, three phase inverters. And if you look carefully at those spec sheets, those uh, Solark 30Ks, those Solark 60Ks need a much higher uh, battery voltage, high voltage batteries to, to make them operate. So historically, if you see on the left there, we have the Phi and Amplify battery, which we've been making forever. Those come in either 24 or 48 volt options. They can only be parallel. So a lot of pieces of equipment out there are 48 volt equipment. With these new uh, commercial systems coming online, they need high voltage batteries. We're able to offer that. On the far right, you see some of our high voltage solutions. That's the containerized solutions, but we also have rack mounted solutions as well. Really, uh, I'm going to run quickly through some of this intro stuff, and then we're going to get into safety and standards here shortly. 2010, we've been founded, so about 13 years ago, about right now. Uh, we already talked about the military uh, testing us. We really progressed into that, um, that kind of energy solutions for residential markets. And I was kind of blown away how new this industry is, right? The first Tesla Powerwall really didn't even come online until 2015, 2016. And that was kind of the first kind of uh, mainstream system, I would say, that really hit the, the residential market. Of course, off-grid systems have been going forever and kind of piecemeal back battery backup systems for uh, residential grid tide had been around, but the idea that you could have a grid interactive energy storage system isn't that uh, isn't that old. And we were some of the first people to hit the market. 2021, 2020, uh, really up to this day, uh, I've been really excited about the acquisition by Briggs & Stratton and Simplified Power. Briggs & Stratton has uh, been known for 115 years as a household name here in America for power production. 
We've been making uh, engines and generators for a long time. And as you see this market evolving, I, I just heard the other day that, for example, in New York State, all new homes uh, or housing developments aren't going to be allowed to run gas lines. So what are you going to do if you don't have a natural gas and you want a generator? I mean, are you going to bury a propane tank in the front yard? Or, or maybe these lot lines don't allow a generator to be put onto the site. So these uh, generator companies like Briggs & Stratton see the future, are uh, getting ready for that future. And one way they did that was purchasing a energy storage system provider like Simplify Power to be ready to go. And with that household name being recognized, Briggs & Stratton, it's really exciting to, to be able to go to a homeowner's kitchen table show them a proposal and show them a name that they've recognized. A lot of the products, we're gonna get through this here. On the left, you kind of see one of our access cabinets. This is an outdoor rated NEMA 3R enclosure. In this example, you're seeing a Solark in there. I believe that's a Solark 12K in that picture. And you have six of our Phi uh, batteries down there in the bottom. We also have more portable systems, uh, I think, a lot of people are overlooking people that live in apartments, people that rent their homes, people that can't otherwise install a permanently mounted energy storage systems. There's opportunities for systems that don't have to be hardwired. On that bottom left, what you're seeing is our express system. It has that magna sign inverter, a charge controller built in there with a couple batteries. Really, all you gotta do is leave it plugged into the wall. That magna sign is gonna keep those batteries on a float keep them ready to go whenever you have an outage. The Express system has an outlet. So you can simply plug in your extension cords and give somebody that could otherwise have something permanently mounted the, the backup capabilities. It also has a, a, a charge controller in case you do want to hook up a solar system to it. Uh, on the far right is that's what I was just talking about a minute ago with some of those rack mounted systems. Each one of those modules on that far right pictures is a 4.3 kilowatt hour uh, stack. And, and you can see, I believe there's 10 in that stack and that would be 43 kilowatt hours. And if you look carefully the way those are wired, they're all wired in series. So instead of parallel, where we're just um, keeping the voltage the same, with series, we're, we're increasing those voltages. Lastly, right in the middle, uh, you'll see our Boss 12 cabinet, just like the uh, access cabinet. But instead of an inverter in there, we've added more batteries, which is fine because that solar and our inverter are outdoor rated anyway. So you can uh, leverage more of those batteries in that cabinet. Uh, notably, the, the Simplify 4.98 battery down there at the bottom right here is outdoor rated, uh, so you can put those outside. Phi Amplify on the far left. Uh, the Phi battery is our standard non-communicating battery. The Amplify battery does have a digital battery management system with closed loop communications. So what does that offer you? Well, a battery that can talk to an inverter, a battery that can talk to a charge controller, can automatically pre-populate set points, saves you a little bit of time commissioning. A communicating battery can offer higher level protections. It can tell a P an inverter, can tell a charge controller what its state of charge is um, or whether or not it's not being charged or discharged properly and tell that piece of equipment, hey, that's not right. Let's go ahead and treat me the correct way. Already talked about the boss cabinets and also that access cabinet. One thing, again, and, and I'm uh, looking forward to some new trainings that we're coming out with, is how can we integrate a generator and in, in energy storage systems so that they complement each other? Rather than thinking of an energy storage system and a generator as competing, there might be opportunities to add energy storage systems maybe to somebody who already has a generator. Let's go ahead and use the generator to charge up the batteries, shut the generator off, save runtime, save fuel. Perhaps you have customers that don't even have solar. So stay tuned for some upcoming trainings that we're working on for about how we're going to dive deep into how these uh, generators and energy storage systems can complement each other. And as you're purchasing something from Briggs & Stratton, we're the experts in both. We provide both. So frankly, if you buy an energy storage system or a generator or both, we're still gonna be able to offer you something. Uh, really, 
one other thing I want to mention on this slide is, is this is a rapidly advancing kind of field. As I mentioned, it's relatively new. So there's a lot of different features that are coming to the market and we're going to be ready for them. There's a lot of hardware already built into our energy storage system that really all it needs is a, a firmware update to leverage. I'm thinking of vehicle to grid opportunities. And I'm thinking of load shedding opportunities. I'm thinking of participating in um, um, uh, virtual power plants as well. Stay tuned for some of that. A lot of you people already know the market drivers. Home is a haven. People work from home now. That was kind of started with the um, advent or the, the beginning of COVID. But existing infrastructure that's not being um, upkept is, is also been historically um, a problem. And you see it kind of here in, in California, for example, we have these uh, fires that were being caused by power lines that were swaying in the wind that were arcing against trees and, and causing these devastating fires. What pg e is doing is now to prevent these wildfires and, and the ultimate liability for these fires, pg e Pacific Gas and Electric, our utility, is just shutting off the grid and waiting for the high wind events to go uh, to finish. They are trying to, you know, of course, bury all those power lines or transmission lines, but that's taking time. Climate-related disasters, uh, other parts of the country, I'm thinking of hurricanes, ice storms, um, uh, big snow events that uh, ice the lines. Another thing, and I mentioned this earlier, is we're really moving towards the electrification of everything where uh, we're gonna be having heat pumps, um, EV chargers. Uh, we're not gonna have gas lines come into a lot of new homes. Uh, and one opportunity that's really driving this market is the ability for um, new ITC credits. So historically, we had a 30% tax credit. It was ramping down there for a little bit, but that ITC has just been renewed. And more importantly, it used to be you'd have to uh, pair solar and storage together to leverage the 30% tax credit. Now, if you read the rules carefully, you can install just storage and take a 30% tax credit. It's not a deduction, it's a tax credit. Other market drivers, especially here in California, is our new net metering rules. Uh, we just went from net metering 2.0 to NEM 3.0. And part of the new net metering agreement that they're pushing through is that you're not getting that kind of one-for-one -one credit anymore for your solar production. It used to be in California, if you were to uh, send one unit of electricity out to the grid during the summer, during the daytime, you could use that credit during nighttime, during the winter time. Now what they're doing is to incentivize or, or kind of uh, make people adopt batteries faster is that they're saying that if you send one unit of electricity out to the grid, you get a fraction of a credit. So essentially, if you produce it and you don't use it, you lose it. So what you have to do is store it. So we're going to see a much greater adoption of energy storage systems in California. Hawaii has been that way for a long time, and we're going to see a lot of other states moving that way. And in a way, we kind of have to do that because in California, there was so much solar production during the day uh, that we were just flooding the grid with this clean energy. We, we have to find ways to store it. A lot of end-use applications, uh, existing solar homes, I see that going to be a big market. Let's come out to somebody's house who already has end-phase microinverters, maybe already has an old grid-tied inverter. Let's AC couple up an energy storage system. Let's not even get on the roof and have to bring it, uh, you know, bring it up to uh, rapid shutdown uh, requirements. Let's not even get up on the roof and touch anything. Let's leave the ladder on the van, leave the ladder on the truck, and just come out and get up to the side of the wall, AC couple in some uh, storage. Time of use rates, uh, I mentioned before, you can save customers money. There's incentives out there to sell back to the grid. Solar ready homes, I think that's a new thing in California. It's a so-called no gas lines to the home. Maybe they've already uh, run conduit up to the roof, to the crawl space. Maybe the main electrical panel has a 225 bus, so it's a solar ready home. Off-grid's definitely been a, a part of the market for a long time. Backup power, maybe we come out to a home and just put batteries. No solar. The batteries are only gonna last as long as they have juice in them. But the idea that we can do that is something that people are looking for. Uh, existing in a, replacing existing energy storage systems, 
has been a little bit maybe focused on just replacing the batteries. But as some of these energy storage systems age out, there is an opportunity just to replace the entire system. Nathan, before I go on, is there any more, uh, is there any questions we have? Uh, none yet. Okay, great. Oh, Let's wait, I'm, I'm missing them. I'm sorry, I didn't have it open. Um, yeah, the first one that came in is, uh, could you share the average cost per watt of your inverter and battery system? So the, I think we're asking two questions, right? And we're going to get into this. When you think about an energy storage system, there's two components. There's the inverter. And the inverter you can think of as, as kind of like an engine. Think of an, uh, an, a generator, right? You got an engine and you got a fuel tank, right? The engine is how much power you can provide. So the inverter is a six kilowatt inverter. Of course, it can surge to start up inductive loads like compressors, um, like um, other motors. And then we think about the um, the energy storage, uh, the, the batteries, and that's the fuel tank. So if we think about how do we break those down in pricing, we're going to think about two things is how much power can we provide and how much energy storage we can provide. I would always say, and I always talk about this with the homeowners, is that um, you can, I could come out to your house and put a 4,000 watt solar system on the home. If you want to go to from 4,000 to 5,000 watts, it's not going to, or, or 4,000 say to 8,000 watts, it's not going to double the cost of the system because I'm already out there pulling permits. I'm already out there doing work. And, and I already have people out there working on the side of the house. So the, the price um, is, is kind of not necessarily a fixed cost. If you want to think about how much power a homeowner may need, how much energy storage they may need, and at what scale you're doing that. And, and there's a lot of package systems that we're coming out with now. So it's, it's not quite an easy answer. I will say this, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be a sticker shock to the homeowner. And when we're talking, uh, when a homeowner starts asking about price right up front, let's kind of steer that conversation away. Let's steer that conversation. Let's not forget about it, but let's steer it towards, well, what is peace of mind value to you? What does it mean to, to have um, clean energy storage with no noise? What does it mean to, to be able to leverage that for 10 years? And what is the lifetime cost of the system? So Nathan, I didn't really ask think, you to answer that, the question. If you want good, to chime in. That's a good answer there, Daniel. I think that, one. Um, you know, on the inverter, we're looking at about 50 cents per watt. And as Daniel said, on the batteries, it's it's really something that's you, you want to compare over the lifetime of the batteries. And since our batteries are some of the most long-lived batteries on the market, right, we offer a full 10-year warranty. If you look at the levelized cost of energy over that full 10 years, um, you're looking at very competitive prices on, on the batteries. Um, I will also say this, yes, Daniel's right on the cost, it is expensive, but now there are federal incentives that you can take advantage of, especially when you're installing um, other renewable energy equipment on the premises. For instance, like heat pump water heaters have an incentive. Um, battery storage now has an incentive even without solar, right? So there are a lot of ways to reduce the cost for the homeowners and make it affordable. And peace of mind matters. I, I, I was actually just te texting Daniel and, and the other guys um, yesterday and saying that my power had gone out and it was only in the downstairs of my place. And so it seemed like just one leg of, of the, the electricity had gone out. It was interesting. Um, Daniel, the next question we got um, was, it was a good one for us because we have a solution for this. And it asks, um, you see, I see your batteries mounted outdoors. What about low temperatures with LFP technology? And so we addressed this a bit last week. We can actually uh, run charging at low temperatures all the way down to negative 20 Celsius, but we start off slowly and, and, and ramp up that rate. And what that does is it warms the batteries up without damaging them and gets the battery temperature to a temperature at which we can run them full tilt. Um, so that was a great question and, and we addressed it last week. And if you didn't get to see that talk, uh, check out the recording. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we have a couple of others who are asking about uh, availability in the Middle East region. Um, and do check on our website for the where to buy uh, functionality. Yeah, thank I'm going to try to answer some of these questions that are coming in online. 
Um, but the last one I, I will answer is the inverter grid tied or hybrid. Can the generator be integrated easily? The answer is yes for our ESS system. Uh, it, it can be, it's a hybrid inverter, or it can be an off-grid inverter, and yes, it has uh, automatic generator start and a generator port to integrate a generator. And so Briggs generators, um, we have running with our equipment, and we recommend them, of course. Yeah, of course. So go Nathan, ahead, and that's an exciting question. I, I'm getting a lot of people asking about how do we get generators and energy storage systems to complement each other? Absolutely, they can combine. And, and with these upcoming talks, look forward to that. Uh, we're, one of the challenges is when you're AC coupling solar and you're trying to charge with the generator. And we're going to talk about some of those solutions at an upcoming training. Stay tuned. We already talked about lithium iron phosphate as a uh, safer chemistry. Nathan explained a little bit about the challenges with cobalt, but also form factor matters. If you're looking at a spec sheet of some of these other competing energy storage system batteries, look at the spec sheets and look at what chemistry they're using. Almost everybody is moving towards LFP chemistry now because they recognize the dangers of cobalt, but not everybody is moving towards the cylindrical form factor, which is what we use. Think of little AA, AAA batteries. That metal case is really able to contain any thermal event that does occur. Pouch cells, which are much less expensive to manufacture, are prone to puncture, prone to swelling. Prismatic cells, not that much bad with them, but again, there's a larger um, cell volume so that they can have um, uh, a lot more venting occurring. And they can also uh, swell and contract. And Nathan, uh, it's not in this slide, but Nathan, you've always shared a, a great um, picture of Will Prowse, a YouTuber that uh, drills several holes in uh, an LFP pouch cell and in a cobalt pouch cell. And the, the pictures kind of speak for themselves. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, one picture, the cobalt has all these flames and, and emanating, and and with the the LFP cell, he had to drill it a whole bunch, and you don't really see that kind of same thermal runaway. Uh, Nathan had talked a little bit earlier about um, that uh, organic electric um, electrolyte, and, and really that's can what cause um, some of that flammable gassing. So again, you can see a picture there of a, a pouch cell that's kind of swelled up. So look for LFP chemistry, look for cylindrical cell form factor when you're looking to get a safe battery. Uh, this is uh, a great kind of breakdown slide of, of kind of comparing those different cobalt chemistries. We talked about the no danger of thermal runaway, no toxic elements. Uh, you know, when it, I've been getting a lot of questions about how do we recycle these batteries? And, and right now it's not that big of a problem. It's also not that big of a problem with solar modules because we all just install them. But Think about five years, 10 years down the road. What I really see is our local recycling centers uh, have specific hazmat disposal hours or sections of these recycling centers. And a lot of these people are becoming more equipped to handle some of these disposals. Uh, abusive mine practices, we're gonna talk about that in a second. No ventilation, right? These aren't our uh, uh, lead acid batteries where they're venting. Uh, no cooling equipment. A lot of uh, cobalt-based chemistries need active cooling systems. They have radiators in them, really, to, to actively cool them. That's a, a, an other mode of failure and something else that can break that would ultimately, um, fail, the battery could fail. We already talked a little bit about uh, withstanding high temperatures, and we don't need that safety monitoring equipment. So I think Nathan talked a little bit about this already, but thermal runaway is when a battery or cell gets hot enough that it starts a chemical reaction, a self-sustained chemical reaction that can then propagate and spread to other batteries. And it's important to note that the, the spread or the, the um, unmitigated thermal runaway isn't spread through flame, it's actually spread through heat. So what is required to really start to, to stop that unmitigated runaway is a lot of water or way to cool down these batteries. And if you think about a battery, it's in a metal case. In a metal case, if you think a lot of these energy storage systems, it's hard to get at these exact cells. So really when we were thinking about this, we wanna be sure that we use a chemistry that's much safer. Nathan explained uh, earlier a little bit about how the, um, the chemical reaction is much quicker but it also is much hotter. So LFP cells um, reach a much higher temperature before that thermal runaway begins. And when they do reach that thermal runaway, they are at a much lower temperature. And, and this is a kind of a graph that illustrates that. 
Uh, what we're seeing here on the, on the left side is that normalized heating rate. On the bottom is, is the temperature in centigrade. And I've kind of graphed out, or I didn't graph out. This is, I think, from um, the Sandia National Labs. Uh, this is a great graph here, is it's showing kind of how rapidly some of these other chemistries um, shoot up and then kind of peter out. Look at that LFP graph. Well, we actually had, they actually had to kind of enlarge the view and, and really zoom in to even see what the, uh, the rate was for those um, uh, LFP chemistries. Yeah, and if you want kind yeah. of some independent uh, in encouragement to go to LFP, um, I, I highly encourage you to read the output of Sandia National Labs and their battery testing facilities. I've downloaded a, a number of presentations and papers from them. Um, demonstrating the safety of LFP. And this is particularly important uh, as we move from electrifying cars to electrifying houses. When, you're, mm -hmm. when you've got something that's inside somebody's house, you want it to be as safe as possible, right? And uh, Sandia National Labs has a lot of stuff that you can download and um, feel free to check out their battery testing and battery abuse center. They have a lot of uh, good information there. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. This is a picture of that active liquid cooling pump that I just um, mentioned earlier. Uh, I think this, um, Nathan, I believe this is a home-built battery that we're seeing on the, on the right hand there. But uh, a lot of other in-production batteries have these, these cooling systems, right? These pumps have a parasitic draw on the battery capacity. It's added cost and point of failure. Uh, we don't need that. We're able to uh, passively cool the batteries in their operation. Uh, one thing is that I didn't realize is that a lead acid battery can actually have a thermal runaway, but it's not that um, exothermic chemical reaction, right? It's it's really caused by the initial increase in temperature and really mainly probably due because you're overcharging the thing. And then you just kind of boil off that electrolyte and then you're getting that off gassing. Um, if it's not properly vented, that hydrogen can be explosive. Um, I there was recently in the news, and I don't know if anybody's seen that. That um, there's a, a new lithium mine. I think it was in the Salton Sea, uh, down in California. And there's also talk of doing this in um, in Nevada. You know, everything we do as humans does have a, a carbon footprint, so we do have to balance um, what we do against other kind of harmful um, harmful practices that that humans cause. Um, so what I always like to think about is, is how do we are, uh, do it the most benign way? And, and one way is, you know, lithium mining does require a lot of water. What they do is they simply essentially pump water down a deep hole. Up comes this slurry of salt uh, and other uh, minerals and, and elements, and then they evaporate it out, and they're able to then process that and remove the lithium. Uh, I do understand that they're able to sometimes uh, recycle some of that water. Uh, but one thing, unlike cobalt, which is um, mined by hand, primarily in developing countries, uh, it, it doesn't involve that kind of human labor um, that can be so detrimental to, to some communities around our world. Yeah, I get that question a lot about lithium mining, Daniel. And yeah. um, because lithium is a salt, it's, it's mined in a similar way to how we, how we mine uh, regular table salt, right? And that's to to evaporate water in which the salt is dissolved in. So it's not it's not the kind of strip mining and and more dangerous types of mining that people envision when we're when we're doing heavy metal mining, right? Um, and so the mining for lithium is really um, not as environmentally taxing as as mining for heavy metals. And then when you talk about cobalt mining. Uh, this is often, most of the cobalt reserves are in, in Africa and specifically in the Democratic Republic of, of uh, Congo, which is where a lot of this mining takes place. And if you haven't looked into some of the mining practices in the DRC, I encourage you to, to do so. What gives me a lot of um, hope, though, is, is I think a lot of um, auto manufacturers, uh, I think Tesla just announced this, and energy storage systems, we're moving away from those cobalt-based chemistries. A lot of people uh, recognize this um, lithium uh, as a, a much 
uh, more stable chemistry and a much more ethically sourced uh, mineral as well. That, that's a great point, Daniel. And I think it's worth noting that last year was the first year that, that Tesla produced more than half of their cars with LFP chemistry. And uh, Rivian announced that they will be using LFP chemistry in all of their cars ongoing. And so more and more of the, the Teslas, especially the Model Ys and Model 3s, have gone to LFP chemistry. And it's another testament to, to the kind of superiority and safety of, of LFP. Thank you, Nathan. One thing, speaking of the salt mines, I always, uh, you know, whenever I'm flying into San Francisco, there's all those uh, salt ponds down there by San Jose. As you're coming in on the, the bridge approach, you can look out the window and see all those site uh, salt mines, uh, salt um, uh, evaporation ponds. One thing that whenever on your plane, I've been hearing this, is that if you drop your phone in between the seats, don't recline your seat, don't get your phone, call a flight attendant, right? Because what they're worried about is you puncturing the battery in your phone, which then could go into thermal runaway in the, in the plane cabin. And I heard stories about a lithium battery fire in an overhead compartment. Um, this is why they actually banned uh, a specific phones um, from flying this, this Samsung one. This is relatively old news, but still it kind of shows just exactly how worried um, the FAA can be um, about um, lithium batteries in airplanes. And one of the ways that they can vet the safety of lithium ion batteries is, is using these Department of Transportation UN um, uh, numbers, right? Or the, the tests. And 38.3 is one of them. Uh, what they're doing is they're essentially simulating what a lithium ion battery would be subjected to in the cargo hold of, a, of an airplane. And if you think of an airplane, you're, you're getting rapid pressure changes and you're getting rapid temperature swings. So they, they perform these tests, um, not in an airplane, uh, at somewhere in a lab where they uh, simulate uh, pressure changes, temperature changes, vibration, and shocks. And, and if, you're if your battery is able to kind of withstand all of these abusive tests, they allow you to um, obtain uh, this UN listing, which allows you to airship the batteries. They also um, you know, short, short circuit the battery um, and, and really overcharge it as well, or some of the abusive tests. Um, I promised we were going to talk a little bit about this, is when it comes time to, to buy one of these batteries or start offering these batteries to your homeowners, you got to look at the spec sheet and look at what UL listings that battery or energy storage system has been approved for. A lot of times your permitters, right, your AHAs, your authority having jurisdictions, if they're a good inspector, they're not even going to let you pull a permit to do one of these energy storage installs unless the equipment that you're pulling the permit for has these UL listings. But not every jurisdiction in this country knows to even look for that or is even enforcing that. So um, that being said, we, we do have these listings, uh, UL 1642, again, on the cell, 1973 on the module level, and 9540 on the system level. And we're going to break these down a little bit more. Even if, say, you're, you're not even getting the thing inspected, maybe you're off grid, well, what if you have some sort of uh, event, not maybe caused by the batteries, but the a house fire caused by the stove? and you have insurance adjusters out there, they may be looking for those UL listings. If you ever go to sell the batteries, I mean, sell the home, uh, there may be an opportunity uh, to do an inspection and they're gonna wanna see some of these listings. So 1642, it's, it's similar to that, that uh, Department of Transportation testing, excuse me, where they simulate abusive environment to see if the cell can withstand some of these abusive um, uh, practices, shock, vibration, drop, uh, heating, abnormal charge, forced discharge. If it passes, right, if it doesn't catch fire, essentially, um, you can then integrate these cells into a larger battery module. And then we repeat those same abusive uh, uh, tests on the module level. And more importantly, we uh, repeat the tests with and without the battery mo uh, management system intact. Right, the battery management system has some internal uh, protections built into it. If for whatever reason uh, you discharge the battery or overcharge the battery, battery management systems can open up. They have contactors in a lot of examples that can open up and protect the battery. Well, UL at the UL labs, right? All this is done by a third party. 
will uh, test the batteries with and without that in place. And we were able to pass uh, the UL listing, this UL certification with and without our battery management system. Once you get a uh, UL 17, UL 1973 module, you can then put it into a 9540A system level certification. And how you achieve that is you really have to pair it with a, a listed inverter, 1741SB inverter now, and a 1973 battery, and then integrate them into the system level. Now, where 9540A comes into play is that it's not a, a certification like we talked about earlier. It's actually a test protocol. And what they do is they, they take, we took one of our energy source systems, we sent it out to the UL lab in Illinois, and they took one of our cells and wrapped it into heating wrap. It forced, uh, heated the battery to such a point that it did propagate to an adjacent battery, and they watched what happens. Essentially what happened is, is not much, it, a little gas vented, but we didn't get that unmitigated thermal runaway. They repeat that test at the module level, and then at the unit level, and at the unit level, we were able to show that we didn't have any uh, defloration, which is a fancy word for explosion, no flaming occurred. And so we didn't need to go down to the installation level, where if we had to go to that uh, level, we might have to integrate uh, sprinkler systems, um, explosion uh, shields, um, other types of uh, mitigation strategies. So we're, it was really powerful to show that we have that UL 9540A. And by having this certification, we're able to avoid some other codes. NFPA 855, for example, calls out that you can only have a certain amount of energy storage in a certain space, that batteries must be spaced a certain amount apart. Well, if we can show that we were able to safely have more energy in a single place, we were safely able to have more batteries packed in a little bit tighter, we're able to then um, um, uh, get around those NFPA 855s. So again, 9540A uh, is making, really it's there to make sure that you're combining together different pieces and parts and making sure that you didn't uh, introduce any unforeseen hazards by introducing different components together. And then 9540A uh, is, is kind of informing what parameters and what uh, installation conditions uh, need to be called out in the 9540. And, and all of this, why does all this matter? Well, a lot of times, um, again, jurisdictions aren't gonna let you pull a permit. And in certain jurisdictions where we've worked for before, this can accelerate the permitting process. I just heard the other day that the permitting, you know, their, their local permitting jurisdiction takes months to get them a permit, especially if they're doing something that a jurisdiction hasn't seen before, like energy storage. Uh, well, having a lot of these uh, memorandum of understanding letters and, and showing that we've gone through some of these tests can accelerate the permitting process. Uh, Nathan, do you want to stop here for questions or should I keep going? Any good ones? Uh, we have some good ones, but I think I've been able to answer them. I'm going to give you the last one here. Can you better explain the LFP runaway temperature? Is that the temperature it runs away or is that the temperature that it burns? Seems extremely cold at 1.5 Celsius. I'm not sure where that came from. Well, maybe Nathan, uh, I'll, I'm going to maybe rephrase that question for you. So I understand that during our 9540A test, we wrapped the battery cell in a heating wrap and we got it to the vent temperature, but the vent temperature isn't necessarily the temperature at the thermal runaway. Uh, can you explain why that is? Uh, sure, but hold on. I, I think that there might have been a mistake here because he's saying that uh, it says at 1.5 Celsius. So we, we definitely don't go into a runaway temperature at 1.5 Celsius. Um, Daniel, if you want to go back a few slides, we could address this one. Yeah. So when Daniel was talking about, I think it's forward. Yep. When Daniel was talking about um, LFP thermal runaway, uh, we were saying it's around 200 degrees Celsius. And then when we were talking later about the test, so go ahead and go forward down through the slides of the 9540. Um, so when we were talking about uh, the 9540 test, 
we are actively, and I apologize if we misspoke, but we are actively wrapping the cells in heating pads um, and heating them up to get them to off gas. So I'm, I'm not sure where the 1.5 degrees Celsius came from. Uh, hopefully there wasn't a typo, but feel free, Matt, to, to clarify um, with, with more questions. Thank you, Nathan. Um, disposal, I, I think, is is really going to be uh, important, especially as um, if vehicle batteries need to be disposed of. Uh, one thing I've I've kind of heard of is uh, these called a second life batteries, where instead of uh, say a, a, a automotive uh, battery is is no longer um, functioning properly, well, somebody could theoretically disassemble that battery, test the individual cells, and then give them a second life. So that was something exciting, you know, reuse something. Um, but again, by having lithium iron phosphate chemistry, uh, there's not as many toxic elements. So you do need to properly uh, dispose of these batteries. Um, and again, um, you, you, a lot of local um, um, recycling centers are starting to be able to catch on to this. I guess the safest thing you can do when installing is is make sure that you're uh, you're competent and your your abilities are there to uh, make sure you can do this safely. I always sort of the term is that uh, I know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, so if if you got to hire a professional, when in doubt, uh, if you're not able to pull a permit, um, and I always encourage everybody to permit all of these installations, um, you're not qualified. So you know, if, if, make sure you get somebody. Um, that knows what they're doing, that knows how to interpret ampacity tables and, and uh, breaker trip curves and understand what, how to properly uh, put overcurrent protection devices in the system. Make sure you got somebody that can understand the, the C, the maximum charge and discharge rate of our batteries. We have a C over two discharge rate. And uh, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, Nathan, we, we spent a lot of the talk just talking about what the, the discharge and charge rates of batteries, our batteries and all batteries essentially can be. Thanks, Daniel. Go ahead. Um, Matt did come through uh, with a clarification. So he was referring to the graph where you showed multiple different chemistries. Um, if you want to go back to that yeah. thermal runaway graph, Daniel, where we look at, and I'll explain that graph a little bit better. Um, so right here. So um, you're, you're looking at on the vertical axis, not a temperature of, of 1.5, Matt, but that's a normalized heating rate. And so that's the rate at which once a thermal runaway is forced, that's the rate at which the heat is given off by the battery cells. Okay, so that, that normalized heating rate is, is measuring how quickly the cells, when they're forced to off gas, how quickly they're actually giving out energy. Um, and it's much slower for LFP. And so that's what you're looking at there, not a, not a temperature. So thank you for clarifying. And again, if you want access to that, this particular graph, it, 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 it is in a, um, is, it is in a, one of the publications that's linked there. Um, and it comes from Samdia National Labs. And, and action, actually, if you want to email me, I can email you the report in which um, this graph contains as well. Yeah, so thank you, Nathan. So if I see here, it's 250 degrees centigrade, right? Or 200 is, is where we exactly. talked about earlier. So it starts at around 200 degrees Celsius. And as that, so we're forcing it into a, a thermal runaway. And as that cell starts to burn the fuel, the electrolyte is burning, right? it starts to heat up. And so you see the temperature rising. And basically when you hit about 240, you're getting the maximum amount of electrolyte vaporizing out of the cell and catching on fire outside the cell. And so that heating rate measures how quickly this happens. It, it, it happens much more slowly for LFP, which is why when you look at the main graph, you have to even zoom in to see it when you compare it to uh, nickel manganese cobalt oxide, nickel cobalt aluminum oxide, and uh, lithium cobalt oxide. Um, so it's it's a much slower burn rate, and you can see that uh, with your eyes when you watch videos of punctures. Um, LFP goes very slowly. So thanks for the clarification. We spent a decent amount of time on this. Glenn asks a question that I'm not sure that I understand. He says, 
Uh, show me where in NFPA 855, it says if you conform to UL 9540, you can ignore the capacity and fire mitigation requirements. We'd have I'm to not... dig a little deeper into that. Um, there is, um, where, where is that one? Um, but yeah, there, there's been a lot of, um, a, a lot of recent changes to that 855. So it, look at the most recent 855 and you'll see that um, a lot of different uh, manufacturers, essentially, if you can show that you've done a 9540A test and you call out in your installation instructions, you're able to um, not necessarily not adhere to 855, you still have to take consideration. And a lot of times different jurisdictions are interpreting these uh, 855 and these tests differently. So uh, it's not across the board that you're allowed just to do whatever you want if you have 9540A. But again, if you're able to show that you've safely done uh, more compact installations, um, you can argue that our 855 doesn't necessarily, that certain specific parts of it allow you to circumnavigate that. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to, we can email me and, and we can jump into that a little bit deeper. I can pull out where that is and look for that. Yeah, and, and most, of, most of the cases when we're asked uh, for spacing requirements, what is referred to is what has passed the UL 9540 system level certification. And the UL 9540A test informs that certification for us. So if we do the 9540 with six inches of spacing, Right, then we can use that for our install. Um, I'm not aware of specific spacing uh, um, requirements in, in the NFPA 855 other than the 36 inches in front of the equipment. Uh, so I, we're happy to dig deeper into this, Glenn, and I know that uh, different jurisdictions, as Daniel mentioned, um, have different interpretations. And then there's also a lot often clarification. And sometimes you get inspectors that can be particularly sticky and we're happy to try to help along um, as best we can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, back to this, uh, uh, really quickly, we're showing here is a uh, grid, non-backed up loads. This is, I think, a, a, Schne a Schneider here. We have our batteries on our DC side, solar, a charge controller, Ge uh, optional generator start, and then our backed up loads panel. So again, this is a great example of how we have DC coupled solar with an AC generator able to provide some backup. Um, again, uh, and I, I think I want to make, I don't know, we're, we're running, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but uh, Nathan has a great story about when he was a professor at the university of a, 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 a student shorting a battery out. Um, I don't know if you want to get into that, Nathan. Yeah, sure. Or... I'll tell it very quickly because, okay. again, we want to be respectful of people's time. But yeah, I had some students that were working on putting together a solar-powered refrigerator with, with a battery start. And uh, one of the students was using a wrench to tighten the lugs down on the battery. And of course, this battery, unlike ours, our battery has breakers on it where you can switch the battery off. Uh, this battery was a deep cycle lead acid battery and, and didn't have that kind of a switch. And so he was using a crescent wrench and turned it. And so the crescent wrench shorted between the positive and negative terminal of the battery. Um, and the student got very uh, concerned about this uh, because the wrench turned red hot and actually melted the lead terminals down through the battery casing itself. Um, and a student ran up to, to find me. I wasn't in my office. Luckily, one of my colleagues ran down to the lab and used his foot to kick the wrench off and break the, the electrical contact. You know, the student could have used a wrench or, or, or something else to hit it off, but I think he, he didn't think of that. If I just would have had an insulated torque wrench in the lab, this wouldn't have happened. And of course, with our batteries, um, you have a breaker there. Always make sure to switch that breaker off. Um, one of the reasons we keep that breaker there is for uh, safety. You know, you can turn, you can isolate components of the system. So, so yeah. do pay attention. Um, and if possible, use an insulated torque wrench to tighten down the battery lugs. Yeah, and, and, and really, you know, we're looking at safety here. Uh, the, all of this equipment, you know, should be, if you're uh, an employer, you should be providing this equipment. If you're an installer, if you're somebody out in the field doing this, use the equipment that your employer has provided. I know it's kind of, you got to go back out to the van, but, but it's, it's really worth it to not get hurt on the job. Um, I also am a big uh, advocate of when you're up on the roof, make sure you're properly tied in 
with your fall protection. Uh, a lot of times we put in some some uh, D rings, or I don't know what they're called, but we we put in tie offs and leave them in a homeowner's uh, roof so that if we ever come back and need to clean the panels or maintain the panels, uh, we're using uh, fall protection. But make sure you know look at the stuff in this photo and make sure that we we have that. Uh, again, Nathan just mentioned you can turn the battery off. How do you turn a, a bat your car battery off? You don't, right? So there is an internal breaker which uh, is, is makes it less likely that you're going to short out the terminals. Uh, when you are integrating batteries uh, together, maybe you're adding new batteries to older batteries, make sure you get the batteries at about the same state of charge uh, and, and follow the right order when you're connecting these, these uh, batteries up. So you're not potentially uh, have, you know, you know, don't turn the battery on before you program it or something like that. So where, um, you know, you're, you're going to make sure, well, I guess you would have to turn the batteries on to program it correctly, but don't initiate a charge cycle or start to turn on loads until you get everything dialed in. You know, make sure you fully charge up the batteries before you start turning on the load breakers. You could turn on the inverter, but don't flip on load breakers yet. A uh, lot of opportunities. I already mentioned this earlier um, about, um, um these uh, uh training um calendars uh there's also we have an iq installation program i'm going to talk to you about uh, an installer program i'd love for people out there to be part of it that are on this talk uh people here on this talk are, are committed to safety and that's something i would love for an installer uh to be if they if they have that in their mindset we have installation manuals more importantly i like integration guides i mean both are important. Uh, I said earlier, right? You can use our battery with the Schneider. You can use our battery with the solar. You can use our battery with that MagnaSign. We created these documents, uh, integration guides that uh, tell you how to program that piece of equipment in the order in which usually that piece of equipment is asking for those set points to make sure you dial everything in properly. Uh, Power Academy, I mentioned it earlier. Um, uh, text 33988 to uh, learn to 33988. Uh, you'll be able to get into the Power Academy. Um, Go.bluevolt.com slash learn Briggs is another way. And I believe actually you can go to poweracademy.com now links to that as well. A lot of uh, on demand. So you don't have to be at a live. A lot of opportunities to uh, attend in-person trainings and also live virtual trainings. Uh, get your phone out, scan this QR code. If you want to be part of our installer program, uh, we will put you on the map. You can see if there looks like there's a lot of um, dots on this map, and there is, but because we're zoomed out so far. But if I zoom in, there's a lot of empty spaces in uh, this country and around the world where I'd love to see your company um, popping up on that. For those of you in, in the Middle East, it looks like we cropped this map a little wrong, so we'll have to um, adjust this map to maybe get you guys represented on that. Please sign up. Uh, we have uh, incentives uh, to make it worth your while in addition to putting you on the map. Um, and, and what I did not put up is a training at simplifypower.com. Uh, that's our, um, that's how to get your, your credits, right? So if you need uh, to get NAPSEP credits, uh, maybe you can, Nathan, you could put that up in the, the chat. Yeah, I've been answering questions with that email address. Um, so it's training at simplifypower.com. Yeah. And uh, if if anybody wants the email uh, responded to in, a, in another question, uh, just feel free to ask, what is your email? And I'll respond again. Um, so you can see it in some of my responses. Yeah, sorry I didn't put that on here. Uh, training at simplifiedpower.com. I, I really want to close this out, you know, um, about the, the NFPA 855 and whether or not how jurisdictions interpret those rules. Um, you know, we're, we at Briggs & Stratton Simplify Power, our batteries are, are, can be more expensive because they're safer. Our batteries can be more expensive because they last longer. And our batteries, uh, we, we spent a lot of money getting, obtaining those UL 9540A requirements. So when you have a jurisdiction that maybe isn't interpreting the rules correctly, be that responsible installer. I always think that having a good relationship with your inspector is really important because you're helping them enforce these rules. Maybe they're not even asking for any permits. Maybe they don't even look to see if you have it spaced. Maybe they're not even aware of NFPA 855. So uh, help educate, be the educator for your inspectors because that inspector ultimately is going around looking at other 
uh, energy storage systems that are being installed from your competitors. And these inspectors can't know everything. They're going to look at a, a water heater, a deck, and then you're at the end of the day with an energy storage system. So it's important that uh, you can be an expert and help uh, educate your inspectors to enforce these rules the correct way. Nathan, is there any closing thoughts you had for us or any last questions? No, I think um, <clears throat> I, I'm happy to talk more with, with all of you. And so if you have questions, Tim, um, feel free to reach us. Um, so training at simplifypower.com. Uh, Daniel and I are happy to continue the conversations. We can put you in touch with the application engineers. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. And if you're looking for that NABSAP certificate one more time, email your name as you want it to appear on the certificate to training at simplifypower.com. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you.